At this time, I would like to read for you our gospel passage for the day. It's found in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning with verse 29 and reading down through the first part of verse 42. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you will see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Yes. This is the gospel of our Lord. Well, as we've already said, today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. A day when we focus on the value of all human lives. <clears throat> on the one hand, I am happy to celebrate Sanctity of Life Sunday because I believe that each woman and man, each boy and girl, has infinite worth. On the other hand, I am somewhat sad that we need to set aside a day to remember a truth that should be universally accepted and affirmed, that each life is precious. On the one hand, I am excited to share this message with you. For I believe that there are infinite possibilities within every individual because each person in this world is a divine creation. On the other hand, this is a difficult message to speak because it comes with a warning to our nation and to our civilization concerning the path that we are on and the end to which it leads. I feel a little bit like uh, Tevi in the, uh, the, the play and, and the movie, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Some of you may remember that. He's going, on the one hand, but on the other hand, but on the other hand, but on the other hand, there is no other hand. Well, <laughs> it's with mixed feelings that I, that I share with you today. But it's so important. In God's Word the Bible, we are told to speak the truth in love. God's Word is truth. And the truth sets us free. The truth must be spoken in love. There is no place in God's kingdom for hatred or bitterness or malice. Only love. We are called to love everyone, including our enemies, and those who do wrong to ourselves or to others. When we talk about the sanctity of life, what we mean is that all human life is sacred. At the very beginning of his public ministry, Jesus made it clear that he loved and valued people. Amen. He stood up in the synagogue to read. And when he did, he read from the prophet Isaiah. A passage which he intentionally selected because he wanted to communicate his priorities. And this is what he read. 
The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, quoting Isaiah. Jesus loves all the people of the world. <coughs> there is a special place in his heart for those who are often marginalized by society. For the poor, the prisoners, the handicapped, and the oppressed. Homeless people, criminals, the aged, and the infirm, those who are persecuted, picked on, and put down. Jesus loves them all, and so do we. Each and every human life is worth more than the whole world to God. Because each person is created in his image. Way back in the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, we read, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now when the Bible says something twice, says the same thing in another way, it is for emphasis. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Don't miss that truth. And then it says, male and female, men, women, boys, girls, are equally created in the image of God. We know that God is the creator of everything that exists. You know, everything that God ever made is like him in some way. Have you ever gone outside of town at night, maybe on a, on a cold winter night, like when you're out walking your dog, like I was last night, and you look up, and you see the stars in the sky. And you think about how massive they are, and they appear so tiny, and they're so far away, and that light has traveled all the way to earth, and you think, wow, how great is our God. Or maybe you have a chance to go to camp, and you're out in a wilderness place, and away from your regular routine, and you look at the trees, and you look at the water, and the lake, and everything is so beautiful, and so perfectly designed, and you say, wow, isn't it? And it's true. The things that God has made show us something of what he is like and how great he is. <clears throat> but here's the thing. When you look at any human being, man, woman, young person, boy, girl, doesn't matter. When you look at any person, even the most down and out person, you are looking at someone who is more like God than anything else he created. Yeah. Think about that. Human beings are the only thing that God said he created in his image. <clears throat> wow. When God made mankind, he created someone more like him than anything else that he ever made. And then, when he sent his son to be one of us, he honored humanity in an incredible way. And then, when Jesus died on the cross for us, he revealed the full extent of God's love for people and the value that he places on each one of us. Jesus especially loved children. When his disciples intended to send the children away, implying that they were not important enough to demand Jesus' attention, Jesus intervened. The Bible says when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. Can you picture Jesus being indignant? I think 
we might say he was royally ticked off. <laughs> and he spoke up. And he said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never <coughs> enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Mark 10, 13 to 16. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. His heavenly Father cares for them. And we love and care for them too. And now, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. The Bible teaches us that early in human history, God chose one nation to be a light to all the nations of the world. The nation of Israel. The people descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To them were given the Holy Scriptures, the oracles of God. And through them, God's Messiah, Jesus, entered the human family. But the fact that they were chosen by God for a special purpose did not make them perfect people. Sadly, the Old Testament tells us how the nation of Israel turned away from the worship of Yahweh the one true God, and began to worship idols, especially an idol called Baal. It's helpful to know a little bit about Baal and how the worship of this idol Baal contrasted with the worship of Yahweh. In the biblical worldview, which Israel once followed, man was sacred, woman was sacred, and the marriage relationship between them was sacred. But in the religion of Baal, marriage and sexuality were debased. There was confusion between the sexes, and the distinction between male and female was erased. It was a downward spiral. The value of life itself was debased. Baal demanded sacrifices. Grain and livestock were not enough. Baal demanded human life. And these people came to believe that if they would offer him their children, he would bless them with prosperity. That was the price of their immorality and idolatry, the lives of their children. The depth of Israel's depravity was reached in the horror of child sacrifices. The Bible pulls no punches. It tells us they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire. <clears throat> of course, there has always been sin in human society and in human lives. But when the killing of children was not only sanctioned, but encouraged, the judgment of God fell and the nation was destroyed. The Bible tells us that what happened to them is written as an example and a warning to us. When a nation and a civilization turns away from God, an awareness of the sanctity of human life is lost. <coughs> and then the society will accept and even embrace the darkest of acts, the destruction of the innocent, the killing of its children. Now, that any culture would permit the killing of its children is hard to fathom. Followers of Jesus know that each of these little ones is precious in God's sight. Isaiah 49, verse 1 says, Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. Think about that. Before you were born, when you were being formed in the womb of your mother, God knew you personally. He knows each child, including each 
unborn child. Abortion has a direct link to paganism. When people become anti-God, they become anti-life. And God takes it personally when human lives are destroyed. Any nation or civilization that endorses and promotes abortion stands in danger of his judgment. Western civilization, including Canada, once held to a biblical morality. I do not by that mean that everybody was a Christian. That certainly was not the case. But I do mean that there was a time when Christian morality was held up as the ideal. That's no longer the case, is it? Christian morality, whether it be in the areas of sanctity of life or sanctity of marriage, the things that were once idealized came to be only tolerated and then marginalized and then denigrated. And if that keeps on progressing, it will lead, in fact, to persecution of those who follow Jesus. We must fight the good fight of faith as if we are on the winning side. Because, in fact, we are. It was on the cross where Jesus died that he won the battle for the hearts and the minds and the souls of women and men. The victory was confirmed by the resurrection. So what do we say to those who have been involved in the practice of taking human life? Or maybe who have gone through it themselves? We do not stand here in condemnation. But we would say to you what Jesus said to the woman who sinned. Go and sin no more. Isn't it good to know that no matter what we have done or what we have been like, Jesus still loves us. He died for us. And he stands ready to forgive us the moment that we will turn to him in faith and obedience. Now I want to say something more here. I think it's very important that as Christians, we not identify ourselves primarily by what we are against. We should be identified by what we are for, by who we are for. By whom we follow, our Lord, who told us, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And so, I ask you this morning, why are we here? For the purpose of loving God. Loving people and making disciples. In the gospel passage that we read this morning, we were introduced to Andrew. Andrew is one of my favorite Bible characters. Do you know why? Because every time Andrew is spoken about in the New Testament, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. He's only just now himself been introduced to Jesus. And the Bible tells us that the first thing he did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. The greatest thing, the most loving and the most life-affirming thing that you can do for another human being is to bring them to Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, On this Sanctity of Life Sunday, we want to thank you for your gift of life. Thank you that you created each and every human life in your own image. And when we sinned and went astray, you sent Jesus not only to teach us and to heal us, but to die for us. That's how much you love us. That's the value that you place on each one of us. So God, today, we come to you. We come to you in repentance. We confess what we have done wrong. 
and what we have failed to do right. We come to you in faith, trusting you, not only for our salvation, but for everything that is needed for life and godliness. So today, God, we ask for your mercy upon our nation, Canada, and upon all those whose eyes are not on you, who do not understand what it is that you want for us. Jesus, you promised life. Life abundant and free. And we claim it now, and we live through your risen Son. 